So in uh, Psalm 91, from the contemporary English version of Scripture, the psalmist is talking about having courage because God is there to protect him. And so we pray, live under the protection of God most high and stay in the shadow of God all powerful. Then you will say to the Lord, you are my fortress, my place of safety. You are my God and I trust you. The Lord will keep you safe from secret traps and deadly diseases. He will spread his wings over you and keep you secure. His faithfulness is like a shield or a city wall. You won't need to worry about dangers at night or arrows during the day. And you won't fear diseases that strike in the dark or sudden disaster at noon. You will not be harmed, though thousands fall around you. And with your own eyes, The Lord Most High is your fortress. Run to Him for safety. And no terrible disasters will strike you or your home. God will command His angels to protect you wherever you go. They will carry you in their arms, and you won't hurt your feet on the stones. You will overpower the strongest lions and the most deadly snakes. The Lord says, if you love me and truly know who I am, I will rescue you and keep you safe. When you are in trouble, call out to me. I will answer and be there to protect and honor you. You will live a long life and see my saving power. All right. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about uh, a story from the Old Testament uh, and uh, we're going to talk about cowards and those who are courageous. So uh, anybody here grow up having to wear hand-me-downs? Anybody? Yeah? Hand-me-downs? Are Okay, yeah. Um, so did it bother you to have to wear hand-me-downs? No. 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 Nobody. No. You know... I have a theory that no one's going to actually say yes to that question, but okay, you're going to say no, fine, stay there, but just know it's a lie. <laughs> anyway, as you know, I grew up an only child, so I, I never had to wear hand-me-downs, but I, you know, I, I still think that for whatever reason, despite the lie, I mean, the people that we have in this church who are lying, I mean, not lying, but... Uh, I think that a lot of people don't like uh, the fact that they had to wear hand-me-downs. And, uh, you know, that isn't surprising, you know, because the truth is we all want our own stuff. We want our own stuff. We want our own clothes. We want to claim and assert our own style, our own individuality. It doesn't matter whether it's a transportation. That's his truck. That's her car. And uh, it comes naturally to us. What's one of the first uh, words that little toddlers like to say when they're with another? Mine. 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 Right? Yeah. <clears throat> but like anything in life, when it comes down to sharing, it depends on your perspective. So you have to ask yourself, what is your perspective? Is the situation that you find yourself in today, is the situation, the circumstance, is it a burden or a blessing? Is the situation you find yourself a curse, a challenge, or a cause for celebration? It's all about perspective how you see things. The same set of circumstances, the same situation can be seen by some one way and by others entirely different depending upon your perspective. Take, for example, the perspective of four-year-old Lauren. And uh, Lauren was asked to give an example of love. And here's what she said. 
I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and then she has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> Don't you love that? I mean, that's a matter of perspective, choosing to see the good. Well, today uh, we're going to talk about, as I said, uh, a story from the Old Testament. Last week we talked about the courage of St. Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian faith. But now we're going to go into the Old Testament and we're going to talk about, about a story there. So the setting is this. The Israelites, about a million of them, a million of them, have been delivered out of Egypt. They've been delivered from the control of Pharaoh. And now they find themselves being led through the desert at the hands and leadership of Moses. And of course, if you remember, in Egypt, the Israelites, God's chosen people, were being treated very poorly. They were overworked. They were underpaid. They were slaves. But those who knew their ancestors of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew in their heart that God had something better for them, something called the promised land, that land that is described as flowing with milk and honey, a paradise on earth, if you will. And that had been promised to them because of their Jewish heritage as God's chosen people. So you remember the story. They've been wandering around for almost 40 years. They've been lost. And so it's been a long, long, hard time. But they're very, very near now to the promised land. They're just on the brink of entering in. And so Moses, their leader, chooses 12 representatives, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel. And the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, represent the 12 sons of Jacob. So Moses selects these 12 gentlemen to go out and scout the land. What does it look like? What are we going to find? Who is there? So essentially, this select group has been selected to spy on the people and their territory, to learn, for example, how fortified the city walls were, how well equipped were the military. They were asked to research the riches of the land and its fruitfulness, and after 40 days, 40 days spying they return with mixed messages. The overwhelming majority of them, 10 of the 12, 80% come back with a rather bleak report. Now, they admit that the crops that they saw were amazing, amazing. That the soil was so fertile and the crops grew so well that even clusters of grape were so grand, so great, so heavy, that it actually took two men to carry back a sample for them to see. But the bottom line was that the majority, the 10 of the 12, were cowards. And here's the first point in your handout. So take a look. The first point of the mark of a coward is this. Cowards see only the obstacles. The fearful see only the obstacles. From Numbers 27, here's the majority report. We went to the land to which you sent us and oh, it does flow with milk and honey. Just look at this fruit. The only thing is that the people who live there are fierce. Their cities are huge and well fortified. Worse yet, we saw descendants of the giant Anak. Now, the majority are not exaggerating in their observations. History shows that city walls back then were likely fortified 
and they were often 20 feet wide and 25 feet tall to protect them from invaders. And then, as for this uh, reference to the descendants of Anak, well, Anak is the bloodline that Goliath actually came from. Remember the story of David and Goliath? Goliath the giant, he's supposed to be at least uh, nine feet tall. And so the descendants of Anak were very, very tall. They were seven to nine feet tall. So to an average person, an average Israelite, they look like giants. Now you might want them on your NBA basketball team, but you sure don't want to go up against them in a fight. But the problem is that the majority are cowards. Why? Because they've lost their perspective. They have forgotten God's great power. And they've chosen instead to look only at the obstacles rather than from a perspective of divine gift and a divine godly point of view. They're looking at it from a human point of view, not from a God point of view. They've forgotten how easily we forget how great this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one, the only true God, they'd forgotten how he promised them this land and that he'd proven to them his strength and his power and his faithfulness over and over and over again. They forgot about the plagues that were sent to torment Pharaoh. They forgot about the spectacular show of God's strength and parting the Red Sea and allowing them to escape from Egypt. They have forgotten that they have gotten as far as they have because of God's might and provision, providing a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night to allow for their safe and comfortable travel. Cowards, the fearful, they forget the promises, the provision, the might, the strength, and the faithfulness of God. They lose their perspective and begin only to look at problems and not the possibilities. They only see the obstacles. They look through the lens of fear rather than through the lens of faith. They look at life through the lens of fear rather than choosing to look at it through the lens of faith woman by the name of Marian Chap Marie Chapman uh, wrote a book called His Thoughts Toward Me, and she writes this little piece about God's perspective to the cowardly and the fearful, what God might say to you if you're feeling fearful. You feel unsafe, unsure, unsure. You don't like to be alone. You're frightened and fear limits the joy you experience in your life. You're trapped in an adventureless existence. What are you afraid of? Pain? Rejection? Are you afraid of making a mistake? Of getting hurt? Of getting a disease? Did you know I, God, am never afraid, worried, frenzied, or never driven with terror? Did you know that your Lord is always at peace? Did you know my spirit, the same as is in me, lives in you? I have built a wall of protection around you so that the invisible dragons of the night will not harm you. I save you from the troubles and dangers of the daytime. I am for you. Who can be against you? But you worry. You worry because of past experiences when you were hurt. You're afraid to be hurt again. You are afraid I won't keep my word. You are afraid I don't care about you, but I do care. Every hair on your head is numbered. 
See me surrounding you and keeping you from evil. See me bringing you up out of a horrible pit, lifting you gently out of the miry clay of fear and worry. See yourself completely safe with your feet upon a rock established in the ways of God. The majority of the spies of the Israelite scouts were cowards and forgot who God was, and as a result, saw only obstacles. But two, two of the ten from the tribe of Ephraim, and Caleb, Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim, and Caleb was from the tribe of Judah. Judah being the same tribe that Jesus came from, which we often refer to him then as the Lion of Judah. These two, Joshua and Caleb, they remembered, they remembered who God was. They remembered all that God had done for them. And they came back as a result with a completely different perspective. So this is the second point. While cowards see obstacles, the courageous see opportunity. Cowards will see obstacles, but the courageous and the faithful will see opportunity. Listen to the minority report from Numbers 1330. Caleb interrupted, called for silence before Moses and said, let's go up and take the land now. We can do it. Now what in the world is going on? All 12 went to the same place. All 12 saw the same fortifications. All 12 saw the same so-called giants. All 12 saw the same rich land, but only two reports. But these two reports couldn't be any more different. Why is that? It's about perspective. The fearful, the cowardly, the majority looked through a natural lens. They gave their report. They gave their conclusions based only on their own human skill and strength, which we all know is limited at best. But Caleb... The courageous, he's looking at it through a supernaturally divine lens and he boasts of confidence to conquer the so-called giants and take the land, not based on his own skill, but based on the supernatural skill and strength which comes only from God, which is completely and totally unlimited. So we see the difference now between the cowardice and the courageous, and that's point three in your handout. The difference between cowardice and courage is one thing only, and that's faith. Faith. That's what separates the cowardly from the courageous. Faith in the power and the presence and the might and the strength and the provision of God. Faith in his promises. Listen to what Caleb says from Numbers 14, 8 through 9. The land we walked through and scouted out is a very good land, very good indeed. If God is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land that flows, as they say, with milk and honey, and he'll give it to us. Just don't rebel against God and don't be afraid of those people. Why, we'll have them for lunch. They have no protection. And God's on our side. Don't be afraid of them. The cowardly majority, the ten, they never reference God in their report. But Caleb the courageous calls upon his faith in the Almighty and says, Fear not. Those same sentiments are expressed by David in Psalm 27 1. He says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who is there to fear? The Lord is my life's fortress. Who is there to be afraid of? That's the same thing that Paul talked about when he was in Philippi. He's in prison. He's in chains. And yet he says, I can do all things through him, meaning Christ, who strengthens me. So cowards, well, they see the obstacles, but the courageous, they see the opportunity and the difference between them is only one thing, and that's faith in God. 
And if you have faith in God, you will adopt a divine perspective. But perhaps the most important takeaway that I'd like you to go with today is the final point, point four in your handout. Remember that God rewards those who have the courage to follow him. God rewards those who have the courage to follow him. From numbers, but my servant Caleb, this is a different story. He has a different spirit. He follows me passionately. I'll bring him into the land that he scouted and his children will inherit it. Caleb, because of his faith, because of his courage, was rewarded with his own portion of the promised land. In fact, it was only Joshua and Caleb from the original group that were allowed to enter the promised land and receive the reward of God's blessings. Not even Moses was allowed to go in. God rewards courage born out of faith. I know this personally, and I can testify to it personally. So just give you a little story. Some of you know much of it already, but I am a recovering lawyer. And uh, when I felt the call to leave the practice of law, uh, I knew that the Lord, I heard the Lord calling me to into ministry to become a pastor. And so I entered uh, Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. Luther Seminary is considered the preeminent ELCA seminary, uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Without question, Luther Seminary is a great academic institution. And while I was there, I got good, wonderful theological grounding. Now, it is a four-year program, but after a couple of years there, two years there, I knew in my spirit I just couldn't stay. I just couldn't stay with the ELCA. I had done well in my classes, but I knew in my heart that there was something missing. There had to be more, more than just head knowledge. And so I like to joke that God just went ahead and created the seminary just for me. So right after two years at Luther, a new seminary opened up that year after I'd finished my two years, and I was among the first to enter a new seminary called the Master's Institute. And I think at the time, I can't really remember I want to say there were like 10 of us, nine or 10 of us, uh, in the first uh, class. And uh, this was a seminary that was not only just complemented the theological grounding, the academics of Luther, but it added this element that was missing, and that was the joy of Jesus. It was the joy of Jesus and the power and the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so I, I, was actually, I was actually the first, because I had two years on my uh, colleague students, uh, I was actually the first to graduate from the Master's Institute. I was first, I like to say, in my graduating class of one. I was first. But as someone pointed out, you weren't just first, you were also last. <laughs> it's all about perspective, people. But I had used, rightly or wrongly, all of my savings to finance my seminary education. After all, I had finished paying off student loans for law school, and I wasn't about to go back there at middle age and have to have student loans again. Now here's a problem. I have now exhausted my savings and I am graduating from a seminary that no one's ever heard of. And a seminary that has no real placement program for their graduates 
or in this case, their graduate. And as that reality uh, began to uh, come down on me, I confess that my courage and conviction that I was following God's plan began to just fray a little bit at the ends, the edges. And then, in May of 2003, weeks before graduation, I get a call from a senior pastor of a Lutheran church in Prescott, Arizona, that worshipped about a thousand people on a Sunday morning. The church was an ELCA congregation at the time. And because I had left Luther after only two years, I was not an ELCA graduate. And those are the only kind that get to preach and work and teach in an ELCA church. But God worked, as he often does, in the supernatural to accomplish what would not have been accomplished by mere mortals. And within three months of graduating in August of 2003, I found myself at this huge church, what would be considered a plum assignment for any ELCA graduate. I found myself at this church pastoring, teaching, and preaching every week at one of the biggest churches in the ELCA. Now, if you told me ahead of time that was going to happen, I'll confess to you, I would have said it was impossible. But God is the God of impossibilities. He rewarded and blessed me even when my courage began to fray just a bit at the edges. You see, God is good. All the time. God is good. Very good. God rewards those who have the courage to follow, even sometimes when courage is small and tentative. St. Augustine said, listen to this. I don't know if this is in the handout or not. I don't know what I did with my handout. Faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of faith is to see what we believe. Faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of faith is to see what we believe. It comes to fruition. It's like the story of a little village, farming village, that was in the midst of a terrible drought. The fields were parched and brown from lack of rain. Crops were wilting from thirst, and people were anxious, and they were irritable as they searched the sky for any sign of relief. And dry days turned into arid weeks, and no rain was to come. And so the ministers of the local churches called for an hour of prayer on the town square one Sunday afternoon. They requested that everyone bring an object of faith for inspiration. And at high noon on that appointed Saturday, the townspeople, well, they turned out in mass. And they filled the square with anxious faces but hopeful hearts. And the ministers looked around and they were touched to see the variety of objects that people had clutched in their prayerful hands. Some brought Bibles and other people brought crosses and some statues and some Catholics brought their rosaries. And when the hour of prayer ended, as if on command, a soft rain began to fall. Cheers swept the crowd as they held their treasured objects, their Bibles, their crosses, their rosaries, their icons high in gratitude and praise. But there in the middle of the crowd, one faith symbol seemed to outshine all the others. It was held by a little nine-year-old boy who had brought nothing more than an umbrella. If you have courage of faith to follow God, he will reward that courage with an abundance of blessings. He will shower you with blessings so great, so amazing, you're going to have a hard time believing them or describing them to others. Some of them will be showered upon you immediately. Some will require a measure of great patience, and some won't be showered upon you until you reach your next destination. But if you live a life of faithfulness, 
If you hold on to courage to see the opportunities for God to work in the face of challenges, if you keep a perspective of faith in a divine and supernatural God doing supernatural work, you will see the blessings. So keep your umbrella because there's a shower of blessings to come for those who have the courage to trust and believe. Amen. Let us now sing our next song, Raise a Hallelujah. <laughs> 